carrier strike groups are the quintessential tool of American power projection worldwide, with over 5,000 sailors and airmen attached to five ships sporting dozens of aircraft and hundreds of missiles, these formations alone are more powerful than most countries' entire air force combined. The aircraft carrier is the heart of all this weaponry. Without it, the carrier strike group loses a huge part of its offensive capability and command and control. Because of this, adversaries of the United States have been developing a series of weapons known as carrier killers. Whether these are a new hypersonic ballistic missile or some state-of-the-art powerful torpedo, countries like Russia and China have been claiming for years to have finally built weapon systems capable of knocking out a carrier. But despite these claims, these weapons remain untested. However, if a war really were to kick off, it is not unlikely that adversaries might use any kind of weapon in a peer-to-peer -peer conflict, including nuclear weapons. So what if a nuclear device was deployed against an aircraft carrier instead of a missile or torpedo? How would it survive? Fortunately for the several thousand men and women that call an aircraft carrier their home, they have a vast array of tools at their disposal to help them to survive such an attack. The first of such tools is not even on their ship, but on the escorts in the strike group. In the event of an actual situation where the enemy could deploy a nuclear weapon, US intelligence probably has indications and warnings that such an attack is imminent. As a result, the intelligence community can feed this information to the strike group. The destroyers and cruiser of the unit can then be on the lookout for missiles and aircraft that fit the target profile. Because these ships are equipped with the Aegis self-defense system, they could shoot down an incoming plane or missile from unbelievably long distances with stunning accuracy. However, if the nuclear attack was a surprise or deployed from a platform that the various units' spy radar could not pick up, then the carrier is in for a rude awakening. Unless the aircraft carrier sees or knows the detonation has occurred, the enemy may catch it off guard. This is because, unlike chemical and biological agents, the ship does not have early warning of radiological contamination. For chemical and biological agents, the carrier is equipped with an integrated point detection system and a joint biological point detection system, respectively. All of the US military branches joined forces in the 1990s and worked on a reliable way to detect these types of agents. What resulted was a system that could test for some of the world's most common chemical and biological agents. If one or both of these systems detects a dangerous substance, a loud alarm is set off throughout the ship. While no such system exists for radiological contaminants, because of a nuclear weapon's nature, the ship will more than likely have received a prior warning and could start taking immediate action to protect the ship. A carrier's first action would likely be to set general quarters, or GQ. When sailors hear the distinctive, repetitive bong on the 1MC, the central announcing system, they know it's time to spring into action. Why the ship would go into GQ for a nuclear attack is twofold. First, a nuclear blast is likely to cause a tremendous amount of damage to the ship. Even the shockwave can cause things like ruptured pipes, loss of power, cracked bulkheads, and other damage. Second, the nuclear strike could be part of a bigger, more coordinated attack, and the ship would still need to be ready to defend itself from other conventional forces like aircraft or submarines. Because of this, those sailors not busy maintaining the ship's integrity are preparing to protect it from follow-on attacks. Once the CO calls away GQ, the first action the ship's repair lockers will take will be to set the right material condition of the ship. All Navy ships have different readiness conditions based upon the type of threat faced. In port, the ship could be in a less restrictive condition like yoke, where many hatches and scuttles are left open. For material condition Zebra, the most restrictive, every door, hatch, scuttle, and valve on the ship is shut to prevent cascading casualties. But for a nuclear attack, sailors would set something called Circle William. For Circle William to be set right, all of the fittings that connect to the outside will be closed. Any pipe, ventilation intake, or door that leads to the weather decks is secured. Perhaps the most critical aspect is ensuring that the collective protection system zones are correctly set. The collective protection system, or CPS, is the system on board Navy vessels that keeps the ship pressurized to prevent foul air from coming inside. Each ship is divided into CPS zones, and the carrier is no different. By keeping positive control of CPS, sailors can ensure that even if contaminated air comes in through a Circle William fitting, the pressure difference will prevent the radiation from spreading far. But of course, the ship cannot prevent all air from coming inside. After all, various systems on board need to draw in air from the outside to function. To solve this problem, the Navy created a unique method of filtering air when the ship has to operate in a nuclear environment. For systems that need to draw in outside air, they put it through massive fan rooms. These fan rooms are split between a clean side and a dirty side. The dirty side is where the pressure differential sucks the air into the room, and the clean side is where the filtration happens. 
Here, massive charcoal filters clean the highly pressurized air of contaminants before it gets introduced into the CPS system. Even though the air filtration and CPS systems are powerful, massive amounts of nuclear fallout material or radiated water will put the ship in a terrible spot. To prevent this, the ship has another external system called countermeasure washdown. Countermeasure washdown is essentially a giant sprinkler system, and it is fed through the ship's fire main loop that draws in seawater through sea chests on the bottom of the ship. The system is also split into multiple zones, with what looks like sprinkler heads spread throughout the ship's weather decks. When activated, countermeasure washdown sprays pressurized seawater all over the deck to keep the deck wet. By keeping it moist, contaminants are far less likely to stick to the deck and cause problems. If a nuclear attack occurs, the commanding officer can choose to use the system continuously or intermittently, depending on the commanding officer's discretion. For the individual sailors, they too have their own protection system, known as the Mission Orientated Protective Posture Suit. These plastic suits look similar to what US troops wore during the first Gulf War. The suit is composed of a pair of pants, overcoat, gloves, and shoes a sailor can place their boots into. The most important part of the suit is the mask. Before going on deployment, every sailor is individually fitted for their mask. The Navy does this because if the mask does not fit perfectly to a sailor's face, it's useless since even the smallest gap can allow deadly toxins into the suit. In a nuclear attack, all personnel would receive their gear. You might be thinking that sailors trying to get gear while the ship is actively engaged makes no sense, and you'd be right. In a real-world situation, the Navy has different levels of mop protection. At the least restrictive level, ships need to have enough masks and suits for everyone on board. As the likelihood of an attack increases, the carrier can elevate the mop posture, which could include actions such as preemptively spraying countermeasure washdown and issuing masks and suits to everyone who would then be required to keep them on station. In the worst-case scenario where a nuclear attack is unexpected, waiting in line to receive mop suits and masks would be a serious problem. For this reason, the Navy is forward-leaning in getting equipment on station early. Another part of the individual kit for a nuclear attack is known as a dosimeter. A dosimeter looks like a little watch that sailors merely slip on their wrist. The device measures radiation, and if it's too high, it makes a beeping sound alerting the sailor to move and seek medical attention. But if a sailor gets exposed to too much radiation either inside or outside the ship, they do have an option. They can go through a decontamination station to purge themselves of outside radiation. Every ship has decontamination stations and the carrier is no different. Potentially contaminated sailors will make their way to their outer clothing undressing area and an attendant in a full mop suit will help cut off their contaminated mop suits and boots while keeping their mask on their faces. When directed, the sailor then heads into the inner clothing undressing area. Here, a sailor strips off all their clothes and gets a highly pressurized, cold shower from openings all around the space. Once showered, the sailor then steps into the air purge compartment and, after this step, is allowed inside the skin of the ship. However, the ordeal is not over just yet. Once a sailor steps outside, a corpsman is standing by with fresh clothes, and a damage controlman is waiting to measure the sailor's radiation with a radiac. A radiac is the only portable radiation measuring device the carrier will have. The DC man needs to ensure that the sailor has acceptable radiation levels. If not, they are taken to a secure area of the ship by a master at arms, or MA. The MA is armed with a pistol and may use deadly force to stop a sailor from running around the ship if they get freaked out when learning that they are now severely radiated. The Navy takes this precaution because the crew does not know what is causing the radiation on the sailor. In the eyes of the Navy, it is better to lose one life than risk the whole crew, but of course this is only a last resort. Those that are radiated that behave calmly are taken to isolation for further evaluation. Those sailors who are busy fighting the ship face a grim existence while at GQ for a nuclear attack. Because they risk contamination if they take off their suits, sailors are required to keep them on at all times. The masks have a hole to put a straw through for drinking, and sailors may remove them only to eat. Luxuries like toilets, showers, and fresh food are secured to save water because the ship cannot purify water contaminated with radiation. What water was left on the ship when the attack happened is what the ship has, and water usage for anything but drinking is strictly prohibited. Not only would sailors have to find inventive ways to use the bathroom, but they would have to sleep on station with their suits on and eat only MREs. Because of all these restrictions, a carrier would only have a short amount of time to keep this up and the commanding officer would be trying to get as far away from Ground Zero quickly for crew endurance. Even with all these protective measures, that still may not be enough. If radiation does get into the ship at dangerous levels, or the ship has suffered such severe damage to not allow meaningful damage control efforts, the carrier's commanding officer has one last thing they can do to save as many lives as possible. Every class of ship and carrier is different, 
but the fact remains that on each one, there are portions of the ship known as deep shelter. Deep shelter places are so low down and easily secured that they can reliably keep sailors safe even if the integrity of the ship is compromised. The only downside to this last resort is that ships have only a minimal number of spaces that can classify as deep shelter and do not have enough room for the whole crew. Those sailors and the captain that remain in place controlling stations like the bridge, combat information center, and central control station are likely to suffer death or serious bodily harm from exposure. If the situation is so bad that it has gotten to this point, the captain's only concern now is saving as much of the crew as possible and getting out of the area. It is a sacrifice that the commanding officer must make.